Greetings to all. I, Dr. Sona Kulke from uh, Sanjeeti Institute College of Physiotherapy, Pune, India. Welcome all our attendees to the 11th edition of Scientifica, which is a virtual conference this time. Think scientific, think research, think global. That's our motto this year. And keeping in lines with the motto, uh, we have with us Dr. Padmanabhan Shekharan today. Uh, he's going to talk on kinetic control, which is gathering or garnering a lot of interest all around the globe uh, for its very different approach towards assessment and management of musculoskeletal disorders. Thank you, sir, for accepting uh, our invitation for this talk in Scientifica 2021. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce Dr. Shekharan. He is an MSc PT from UK and Chief of Physiotherapy and Rehabilitation Services in Sparsh Group of Hospitals, Bangalore. He's a specialist in movement analysis for injury prevention and sporting performance and has more than 20 years of clinical experience specializing in musculoskeletal injuries from tertiary hospitals in India. He's a published author with 18 international uh, sorry, peer-reviewed publication, which includes the Journal of Arthroscopy, Journal of Shoulder and Elbow, and European Journal of Orthopedics and Sports Traumatology. He's an international resource person and a kinetic control accredited tutor who has conducted more than 100 workshops for physiotherapists and sport clinicians across all major cities in India and abroad, which includes UK, UAE, Malaysia, and Kuwait. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, I guess I'll give over the session to Dr. Padmanabhan without wasting much time. Thank yeah. you. Over to you. My pleasure, ma'am. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for that uh, introduction. And it's, it's really a pleasure. I didn't realize that Scientifica has been happening for the 11 years now. Tremendous job. Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm really very glad to be part of this uh, uh, prestigious conference that you have been hosting. Uh, I have come to Sanjeti and I have really enjoyed the hospitality of uh, Sanjeti and Puna and I'm, I'm really glad to be part of it. So thanks a lot again. And my topic um, as requested is uh, kinetic control. And um, I'm pretty sure you all have heard about kinetic control. I am specifically going to talk about how to, uh, um, you know, what, what essentially it means in terms of what is the movement health model that we have been uh, proposing and teaching and what are the clinical applications of it. So that's essentially what we're going to talk today. So there are two takeaways from this talk. So what is movement health and how can we apply this movement health model in clinical practice? So those are the two takeaways. Before we go into movement health, let us explore the fundamental uh, question. How do, we, how do we use and how are we using movement in our clinical practice, in physiotherapy clinical practice? We all know that medical specialties are based on anatomical or physiological system. For example, we know what an orthopedic surgeon does, which part of the system he belongs to. We know what a neurologist does, and we know what a cardiologist does. They all represent one system. And what do physiotherapists do? What do physiotherapists do? Can we call ourselves um, the specialist in all the system because we study neuro, cardio, um, and of course, musculoskeletal? Is that, is that what we are, specialists of? all the system, or are we specialists of one system? Uh, why is this important? Why is this important? Because we want to be known as practitioners of choice. We choose to do uh, what we want to deliver as part of the healthcare system. You know, why is this important? This is important because when we choose to deliver, then we become what we call as the physiotherapy professional. Now we are delivering as part of you know, a part of the healthcare system, we deliver our physiotherapy is being delivered more as a service. That means the patient comes and asks you what needs to be done. Or uh, an orthopedic surgeon tells you how many IFT sessions to be done. We can, we can claim that we are slowly emerging from it, but instead of fighting it, I think if we identify ourselves as part of one system, then that's when we are going to be professional rather than a service provider. So most importantly, we have to make sure that our patients know what we do. What do our patients come to us for? What do they come to us for? Do they come to us for pain? Because for pain, they go to a pharmacist or they 
they can go to a orthopedic surgeon, they can go to a pain physician, but what do they come for? Do they come for paralysis? Okay, they come to go to a neurologist. They come, they, do they go to a, go for an injury? We have no clue. That's our patient know what we do. That's essentially what is the relevance of why movement should be our practice. This is something we call as our professional identity. And I'm pretty sure you all must have seen this paper by now. If not, please go ahead and, and then look for it. This is in the APTA journal and it's by Shirley Shaman. I call her the godmother of physiotherapy. So why human movement system is our professional identity? You know, why? And then the paper goes about talking about why it should be the identity and why you should not lose this identity. Okay, because as you can see, as public health becomes the primary driver of um, you know health in the society, people are looking for ways to maximize their movement potential. They want to exercise. They want to be part of you know being healthy rather than being part of the disease um, continuum. So unless and we are positioned exactly as someone who can take from healthcare to the healthy living. And that's exactly why we should own the human movement system because the way I see it, if you don't build that identity and this identity is going to go to a personal trainer or a strength coach. And that's, that's essentially what is happening elsewhere. And uh, so we have to own the movement system and it has been, she has been proposing this for quite some time. Her first paper was in 1998 and 2014 is, uh, uh, is, is a follow up of it. And please do read this paper. Movement system is being integrated into the primary care education, meaning physiotherapy education. So this is a proposal. This is 2017 paper. And in, in fact, it's a special series on movement system in education. And how do we integrate it? This is, this is part of the undergraduate study. So how do we, how do we integrate it? Musculoskeletal practice, the basic ability for any mus aspiring musculoskeletal therapist should be is the ability to observe movement and then observe typical movement and what is a pathological movement. And if you do observe or see a pathological movement, you have the ability to choose a movement-based intervention, which can be an exercise, corrective exercise or a mobility exercise. Okay, so this is, this, this is going to be the driver of musculoskeletal practice. And of course, uh, it has been proposed to be, you know, adapted in the neuromuscular practice and also in the cardiorespiratory practice. So I'm going to talk predominantly on the musculoskeletal practice. How do we integrate? What is kinetic control? Kinetic control is a clinical framework of analyzing movement. It's a system of assessment and treatment. We constantly upgrade the evidence every year we meet and then we constantly upgrade what is new. And it's, it, there is exciting evidence coming in every year to support this model. And kinetic control is not a treatment technique. That's why I don't teach kinetic control or certify anybody. Uh, it takes about one and a half years to become a movement specialist, whatever you call it. It's not a two day program. It's a, it's a one and a half year program. You go through, you know, alternative months and that's how you finish. So it's not a treatment technique. And we look at the way people move. Why looking at the way people move is important because we are moving into an era of what we call as health. Okay. I'll describe this in detail. I'm pretty sure everybody has heard about the physical health with the COVID times. We all know how important somebody asked me, uh, are you healthy or are you fit now? Just because you're fit, it doesn't mean that you're healthy. Okay. So health has got a different connotations or different explanation and different, um, you know, foundation to it. Health essentially, according to WHO, is, is not, you know, it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, not necessarily the absence of disease or infirmity. So, essentially, just because you don't, um, you know, you don't have a disease doesn't mean that you are healthy. Yeah. You should not have any weakness. That's what it says. And mental health, I'm not going to touch upon it. I will say what exactly uh, is dental health. I think we'll explain this. Uh, in the 80s, if you had a toothache, you went to a dentist and then the dentist wanted to be part of the healthcare um, of the healthy uh, movement. So they said, if you have a tooth, you have to come to us. You know, you don't. So now everybody goes, everybody who has a tooth has to uh, goes to a dentist. You know, it may be for the brazers, it may be for your um, general maintenance. OK, so that is how you expand the scope. And now this is an era, we live in an era of what we call as lifestyle disorders. Uh, everything, every disease 
has a lifestyle problem attached to it. Lifestyle essentially is lack of movement, okay? And this is the era of movement health. So instead of us looking at a patient with what we call as back pain, we look at patients with back. So that's the model, okay? That's essentially what is the movement health model. So we have defined it. We have defined it as a concept. We'll come to that. Before that, we have to understand that identifying the problems in movement and then helping somebody to move efficiently is going to be a key therapeutic skill which every physiotherapist sh should possess now and definitely in the future. Now, you know why this is important? Because we are not going to treat, say, say for example, this, this example, you have back pain and then you go and treat them how to, the back pain and then back specific exercises. Now, what if I told you that you are able to see somebody's back and then you're able to predict that this person is going to go have back pain, especially if he is in a high risk environment, for example, he's going into a software industry or he's an athlete who's going to do use his back either for lifting, carrying or to do a somersault. So even before he, you know, he uh, has or developed back pain, you're able to identify and then you're able to correct, you're able to intervene and then you're able to correct and you're able to prevent back pain. And this you can do for someone who has just started moving and then to a level where he is not moving any longer because of back pain or because of degenerative changes. This is what we call as movement lifespan. And the advantage of this model is like how you don't wait for diabetes or a heart attack to go and diagnose yourself whether you are at risk. You just go and then check every six months after or one year after you are at a particular risk. So same way you are going into an industry and you are at a particular risk for a musculoskeletal problem, you are going to be screened, okay? And that is how physiotherapists are going to be relevant and that's how uh, exciting this model is. So we are proposing what we call as the movement health checkup, okay? Because we are not waiting for you to get back pain. We say that we will prevent back pain and then we also look at how healthy your back is or your movement is. So that's essentially is the scope of this concept. We have defined, defined movement health. This is in a paper 2015, a desired state, which is not only injury free. That means you don't wait for your back or your shoulder or neck, whatever. You don't wait for it, but you are able to choose how to move. So choices in movement is, is, is essentially the terminology, the choices in movement. For example, somebody has a back pain. He says that I can only sit and get up from a particular chair. I can only tra travel for so many hours. I can only uh, stand and walk, but not bend forward. I can bend forward, but I cannot bend uh, at the spine, but I have to bend at the hip. Okay. So this is not about it. So back is designed to do somersaults. Okay. So back is designed to do deadlift. So if you have the ability or what we call as choices to use your back or use your shoulder, use your knee, use your neck for anything that you want to do, then you have got a very good movement health. And due to an injury or due to a pain, if you're not able to do it and then you are restricting, then you lose the health. So that's essentially is what is the concept of movement health. Can it be tested? Like how we test physical health. We test physical health by doing your blood test, x-ray analysis and all that stuff. Can it be tested? Of course, we do. We have devised a battery of tests. We call them the movement control tests. And of course, the reliability and validity of this test has been established over the years. So we look at movement through a battery of tests by the concept of subjecting the movement in different direction and observing under different conditions. Okay, this is what I teach as part of the course. Can it be tested? Yes. Can it be tested reliable? Yes. Can it be, is it a valid test? Of course. And can it be used to predict, prevent and also treat movement related problem or movement related dysfunction, 100% yes. Okay, that's essentially what we do as part of kinetic control. So what are the components? So when we, when we test, what are the components that we look for? Okay, what are the components of movement health? So the first thing is we looking for the ability to control a movement. So for example, you have a low back, back and then I'll stick to the back example. So you have a back, and you have to sit and work in front of computer. Okay, and we all know about the slouch posture, which I will be explaining uh, in the clinical uh, example now. You have a slouch, 
posture, which essentially is a lumbar spine flexion. So, okay, why is this lumbar spine flexion induced? Because you're not able to maintain a neutral spine, okay? And then you're not able to control the flexion. So we look for when is this control being lost, whether the shoulder or the upper limb is moving on top of it. For example, you're driving or you're typing on your computer or when you are extending your leg, whether you're, that induces your uh, you know, lumbar spine flexion, for example, again, driving okay, or kicking football. So are you able to control your lumbar spine flexion? Are you able to control your shoulder upward or you know, scapular upward rotation? shoulder medial rotation, neck, low cervical flexion. So that's what we're looking for, okay? That's the first component of movement health. The second component is the intensity. I have the back which I can sit and work in front of computer, but if I have to drive or if I have to, you know, do cycling as part of my routine activity um, or my fitness activity, or I have to do a deadlift. So intensity, that means when the load increases or the time increases or the speed increases do i do i have the ability to control the lumbar spine flexion just because i'm able to sit without the lumbar spine flexion in sitting doesn't necessarily mean that i'll be able to take this ability into um, you know doing a cycling okay so that's essentially what we look for the next part of the movement health and variability so do you have the ability to move the back, not necessarily control flexion, but also able to move in multiple combination, flexion and extension, extension side bend, flexion rotation. So do you have all these abilities and do you have the ability to integrate this into a throw? For example, a throw or a tennis serve should be a flexion and then rotation towards the opposite side. And a football kick would be an extension and rotation to the uh, opposite side. So do you have these kind of variabilities? Okay. So that's also a component of good movement health. That's also what we have to look for. And awareness. So do you have the ability to know that the lumbar spine is starting to move into flexion? Okay. And do you have the ability to sense this when you are sitting on a chair, sitting on a sofa, sitting on a park bench, sitting and riding a horse or a motorcycle? Okay. So this awareness is also part of your good movement health. Yep. So that, those are the components that we look for. So the kinetic control movement health model is very comprehensive. And then what we teach is essentially uh, this model. And then we train people to essentially have the ability to apply this in clinical practice. So what are the, what are the components of movement health philosophy? First, we look for are there problems in movement? So that's what is a movement impairment. And if there are no problems, is the movement efficient? Okay, that means is it is it does it does the movement has the ability to integrate into function, or is it are you able to sustain the movement? For example, sitting is a sustaining sustaining uh, ability, and then riding running is a movement that has to be uh, you know repeated. Is the right muscle controlling the movement? For example, if you are sitting for a long time, you cannot use your erector spine to sit. You will tire out. Instead, you have to use your multifidus to, um, you know, sit. That's when you will be able to uh, sit for long hours. So, muscle control of movement for the task. Is there a cognitive control? This is where I spoke about the awareness. Okay, you you are not supposed to think about uh, your back when you are sitting on and working. So, is that is, it, is there a control mechanism by which it happens automatic? And is that control lost? And do you have movement choices? Like I say, you have the back that has the ability to sit and work in front of computer. Is that back able to do a deadlift? Okay, so that's about movement choice. And does the patient have pain? And if the pain was, pain was addressed, but then he has recurrent pain, that means the cause for pain was not addressed. That means the dysfunction. And when the dysfunction is not addressed is when they have recurrence. So by knowing whether they have pain, dysfunction or recurrence, and then looking at all the components of movement health, we'll be able to treat them comprehensively. And that's the advantage and that's the value of the movement health model. Uh, just an illustration. So it's it's very simple. It's nothing, nothing complex, very simple. So when you look at the first component, which is essentially the movement impairments, there are only basically problems in the way people move. There are only two ways, two problems in the way people move. Either they are moving more or moving less. 
So moving less is the restriction part and moving more is the compensation part. So the second question is essentially where they are moving more or where they are moving less. So if they are moving less and then if they are moving less at the joint, that's called as an articular restriction. So we know that what to do here, your manual therapy fits in here. So if they are moving uh, less and then if they are moving in the range, then it's, it can be articular, it can be a myofascial problem. Okay, this is where all the excitement in physics that is happening right now. And if they are moving less, there, there has to be a compensation either in the segment above, below or in the same segment. Okay. So that is what we call as an uncontrolled range. It can be a compensation for restriction or it can just be a hypermobility. And the last part of the movement is essentially they are moving more, but they are moving at the articular side. It's, it's like your uncontrolled translation of your humerus, okay? Um, subluxation of your petula, your lysis, lysthesis. So that's also an abnormal movement. So when you look at somebody moving, you at least have to realize that it's not about restriction, it's not about myofascia. You always have to look for all the component. Okay, that's essentially what we teach. Okay, that's essentially what you start looking at straight away when you look at movement impairment. And that's that's essentially is the difference between a manual therapy versus movement therapy. Manual therapy, you look at this quadrant and movement therapy, you look at all four quadrants. Cool. Now the second part of the presentation. Yeah. So is this a clinical problem? Is this a clinical problem? I think if you put up put a picture, I think everybody will go up and then say, yes, of course. What is the problem? It's a posture problem. Okay. Uh, what is the posture? Of course, there is, we call it as an alignment, but anyway, posture is a familiar word to connect with. So that's a that's a sway back and that's a slouch. Now let's take this example. If I say this is a slouch posture and ask for a management plan for any physiotherapist, okay, any physiotherapist. Um, then we are looking at, you know, a posture correction exercise, lumbar extension exercise, a stretch, a mobility. Okay, so we are looking at all these. I, I'm, just, I'm just going to say how we approach it from the movement health model and then how do you approach it comprehensively. The first question to ask is who is this patient? Okay, this may, be, this may be someone who's sitting and working in front of a computer, this may be a cyclist, or this may be an Olympic deadlift guy, or anybody, or this may be a yoga person. Do you think, based on the way people use their backs, okay, your intervention will be customized or your intervention has to be different? Is it not? So that's the first question, because you will have to customize to the health of the patient, okay, to the movement ability and the movement control of the patient. That's why it is important to ask that first question. Who is the patient? Where is his pain? Where is his or her pain? Is it in lumbar spine? Then lumbar spine is the primary problem. I know physiotherapists, um, you know, believe that if you correct the foot, your back pain will become all right. But then you have to, after you've ruled out that there is no problem in the back. Okay, where is the pain? Site of pain is a site of dysfunction. What type of pain? Not all type of pain you can fix with a movement intervention not all type of pain. Okay, what is the type of pain? The type of pain is mechanical. What is mechanical? A type of pain which is insidious onset, which is static loading pain. That means it comes after some time. Repetitive loading pain after you sustain and do an activity repeatedly. It is a chronic or a recurrent pain. Then you look at the posture which contributes to this pain. I have pain, I have pain when I sit and work in front of computer. I have a lumbar spine flex posture. Okay, then it correlates. Then you look for movement, you ask her to move. And then you see that when you're doing a forward bending posture or when you're sitting and working in front of computer, you are actually flexing the lumbar spine a little earlier than the hip or the thoracic spine. And that's probably, that confirms that there is an uncontrolled movement in the lumbar spine in the direction of flexion. What box does she fit in? Boxes are the ones which I showed you before, okay? These boxes, these four boxes. So what boxes? Is there, a, is there a, is this lumbar spine flexion caused because of a restriction in the hip or restriction in the thoracic spine or it's simply an excessive movement at the lumbar spine. So you have to fit into that boxes because the intervention is different. It cannot be all one size fit in all. So the intervention will be very specific and it will be different based on uh, where is the problem. And what is the management plan? How is the movement control? This is what we look for when we do the movement control test. Okay, we do what we call as a dissociation where we fix the lumbar spine and move either above or below. 
and then we are we are able to see whether the lumbar spine flexion is produced because of the thoracic flexion or a hip flexion so that's what we test for and once we test then we retrain the movement control by either stabilizing above or stabilizing below then we retrain the muscle what is the muscle which controls this movement for example the stabilizer muscle which controls this movement here is the lumbar spine multiplex in this example like that every direction has got a muscle which controls it which is a stabilizer and a mobilizer which takes over this job so we have to inhibit the mobilizer and then train the stabilizer so that's essentially for the lumbar spine that would be a multiplex and an erector spine are there other factors for example proprioception you are actually flexing the lumbar spine because you are not aware that the lumbar spine is moving into flexion after you sit for half an hour so how do we how do we know that by doing what we call as the kinesthetic repositioning ability or kinesthetic repositioning accuracy so we do test for it and then we train for it and then you also consider a local stabilizer which can be a multifidus when will you suspect a local stabilizer problem if the patient's problem is recurrent or he has undergone a significant injury in the past this may be a surgery okay where the local stabilizers will inhibit and then that's the reason for the recurrence of the pain so you will con consider that also and then is this the patient based on who is the patient the first question who is the patient you will integrate them into the function so if is someone who is sitting on on the computer then that's the function they want but if she is someone who wants to do a deadlift okay or if someone who wants to ride a horse or do a somersault then your treatment is not complete till you restore that option to summarize so we move we move from being a physiotherapy service to being a physiotherapy professional that means we choose what system we treat it is possible if we go from pain management that means we don't treat back pain to movement management where we treat back which moves in any direction that it wants to we move away from an anatomical structure where i did not talk about the disc i did not talk about the you know nerve we move from the pathoanatomical model to the movement system model we look at the back the way the back moves and then we treat it as an entire okay we start at movement impairments that means we start with what is wrong with the way people move when they come to pain but then we go into a movement health model which is the kinesio pathological model where we predict that the patient is going to have pain before they even have pain okay so that's essentially what the movement model continuum two takeaways what is movement health i think i said that and how do we apply this in clinical practice for one case scenario which is the slouch posture and i did not say anything about changing the chair thank you thank you dr padmanabhan that was truly an very informative in fact i guess the most difficult part for dr padmanabhan was to concise his talk he is used to talking for 2 to 4 hours based on the same topic so to kind of fit it into a talk which would kind of be for 25 minutes or so uh, was a challenge i guess for him uh, the very interesting part about kinetic control and the theory which excites me a lot is that we have moved little away from the pathan anatomical model towards a movement impairment model now uh, sir we already know that uh, we do see a lot of uh, disc prolapses which yeah. are completely asymptomatic yeah you know we see a lot of rotator cuff tears almost 50 55% of the population who are totally asymptomatic yeah. so we have to kind of consider or move away from the patho anatomical uh, model towards a movement impairment and i like the takeaway also about just like a dentist who takes care of teeth for the lifetime you know right from pediatric to geriatric it has to be also that the we are going to become movement doctors yep we diagnose a movement not only when it's impaired but also as you said before it develops an impairment or before the pain develops yep. so this is a very important step towards a direction that i guess we should all be moving into because it not only improves the scope of our practice but it also kind of puts up a niche area for physiotherapists to operate in 
and uh, i guess that's where our speciality is and that's where we should be moving you know and uh, yeah very nicely about a slouch posture without the use of a or without advising any change in the chair that the person is sitting is again a new way of thinking towards how to go about managing a patient yeah. uh, so what the question that i wanted to ask you very often is now you did talk about there are many theories which talk about that even if uh, the back pain is there um, it could be kind of arising from another structure some place or uh, referred from other place or uh, like there's a full thought process related to the myofascial chains mm -hmm. which says that you have a back pain uh, just kind of uh, uh, try to uh, do away with the plantar fascial tightness mm -hmm. and hopefully your back would also kind of be taken care of yes. so there is a, a, a kind of a line of thought in that process also whereas i guess movement impairment model talks about that wherever the pain is maybe uh, the issue is there Yeah. So, so uh, what is your take on the other uh, aspects of? Uh... Yeah. Okay. Um, I answered this a little funny way in the workshop. Okay. I'm pretty sure I don't want to answer it the same way here. Okay. I, I'm okay. Fine. I'll do that answer. I normally say the the dog can wag its tail. It's not the other way. The tail cannot wag its dog. So, if there is a back pain. okay and there has to be some problem at the back first okay so you you and after you have actually assessed diagnosed and then ruled out that there is no primary uh, mechanical or a movement related or pathological problems in the back then you can look at the segment above and below that's that's how it works okay so you look at the thoracic spine okay and you look at the hip and then if you have ruled that out then you look elsewhere that means you look at the knee look at the foot yeah that's what this, that's that's what would be the logical and scientific way of uh, actually going and of course uh, do they do get is it all connected 100% it is all connected for example yes. the most popular way of uh, feeling a back pain is probably um, you know maybe stretch the plantar fascia and then see that your lumbar spine traction increases so that there is no real problem in the back i agree but then is it sustainable meaning is it sustainable and is it a, is it a treatment it's not a treatment okay you are you are only uh, showing a short term uh, neurophysiological uh, inhibition okay that's that's how the science works okay if you look at the science of it but is it able uh, is the patient able to sustain uh, no they are not able to repeat it yeah so i don't have any problem you doing any intervention on the foot but i do have a problem if you have not fixed it, fixed the primary um, you know site of pain yes. so the, our our message is very straight forward site of pain site of dysfunction that's all and if you have ruled it out then you look for the segment above and below if you have ruled that out then you look for elsewhere yeah and of course there are alternative ways of treating it alternative theories okay and uh, even prayer heals okay so but this that it should be very very specific and scientific